First song tonight will be number 419. Number 419, Lord, we come before thee now. Sing all four verses. <clears throat> Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace. To Before our scripture reading and prayer, we'll sing number 500, all three verses. Number 500, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <clears throat> o Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of Oh. 
Scripture text tonight is from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Will you bow with me, please? O righteous, almighty God, our Father in heaven, we humbly bow in your presence and express the joy and the thankfulness that's in our hearts to be in the kingdom of your dear Son. Thankful, Father, to know of that eternal home that awaits those who, who will not faint. Um, we are thankful, Father, to, to be at work in your kingdom, to have the responsibilities that we have, and to be at work in the greatest work known to man. Father, we're thankful for a good day, the first day of the week, and it's the day in which your son raised from the dead. What a glorious day that is, and what a glorious day this has been for the Crossville congregation. We are so thankful to you for the blessings that have been poured upon us. Help us indeed, Father, to gird up the loins of our mind, to be sober, and to hope to the end, for that grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We look forward to that day with great joy, and we're thankful, Father, again, that we have that joy. We pray for a world that is lost in darkness and does not have such joy. We are thankful, Father, to have the opportunity again to be at work and to be spreading the light, to have that light reflected in our lives to those around us. We pray, Father, for the influence of that light. Father, we pray for our country. We are thankful for our country. We're thankful, Father, for the freedoms that we enjoy Thankful, Father, for the many sacrifices that were made for those freedoms. And we pray, Father, as we recognize that those freedoms can be just given away very soon, very short, very quick. And we pray, Father, that, uh, that we will not do that, that we'll hold them dear and, and uh, that we'll strive diligently to uh, preserve those freedoms. We look forward to the election. We pray, Father, for a good choice to be made by our country. But we recognize that you are in charge of all things. We recognize that you uphold all things by the, by the, the word of your power. And we pray, Father, um, uh, and that includes the kingdoms of this earth. We know, Father, that, um, that it might be uh, that, uh, that our country has to do some very bad things before more people will turn to you. We pray, Father, we don't want that to be the case, but uh, we pray that we know that your will will be done, whatever is done. We look forward uh, to our eternal home. We thank you for our opportunity to be here this night and to study from your word. Uh, thank you for Alan. Thank you for his diligence in study and for his eloquence in presentation uh, and his love that is demonstrated in his presentation. Uh, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Preparation for our lesson will sing number 71. Number 71, Blessed Assurance, all three verses. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior.
Good evening. Thank you again for joining, uh, joining us tonight via our conference call or by our live stream. I always thought I wanted to be on TV when I was a little guy, but the more that I am, the less I like it in some ways. And uh, I've got a face for radio. You know that already, but uh, nevertheless, some of you will get that a little bit later on tonight about the time you get ready to go to sleep. You can thank me then. But anyway, uh, we're thankful that we can be together even uh, in this remote capacity uh, this evening. Tonight, uh, as we typically do, on uh, the third or sometimes the second, I kind of alternate these back and forth. Those of you that are very observant, you've noticed that. You say sometimes you do that uh, old preacher stuff on the third Sunday night and the object lesson on the second. I know I switch them back and forth, but tonight, an object lesson. Jesus often took things of everyday life and said, what can we learn? So the sower went out to sow, a very common sight uh, that everyone in Palestine would have observed from time to time. But he said, you receive the word of God. What type of soil are you? as the seed, which is God's word, is sown into your life. Uh, we've looked at how Christians are like popcorn or gummy worms, even like fireworks last week. Well, I want to take an object lesson tonight and look at this uh, fun uh, little piece of equipment. Now, some of you would say that's an instrument of torture, but uh, I assure you uh, that it's not. I have a few nodding heads here. Uh, I have enjoyed cutting grass all of my days. Uh, it was, I'm sure, I think I was around uh, six or seven uh, that my grandmother had an old Murray push mower that she gifted me. Now, if you know anything about Murray lawnmowers, uh, they're worth absolutely nothing. And this one certainly was, but uh, I tinkered with it and my father helped me and we actually got it running and uh, I could help him uh, push mow the yard. And I was delighted to do that. After Amy and I got married and moved to West Tennessee, working for a congregation there that had a big bank that was overgrown with honeysuckles, I asked them if I could clean that up. And you know what? They let me. And uh, they didn't even pay me any extra to do it. They said I could gladly do that. And so uh, Friday afternoons when I got out of class, that was my stress relief. Uh, I bought a uh, push mower with high wheels on the back, and I would mow that bank usually until about... Uh, time to run home, grab a shower, and then get Amy, and we'd go to the high school football games on Friday night. That was a good memory. Uh, Adrian got his first lawn mower when he was just a little over a year old. It was a plastic model. He pushed it uh, through the yard. He graduated to the Fisher Price kind that you could put a bottle of bubbles in, and it would make the little bubbles go out the side. But he would be following me, uh, I'm sure, when he was only four or five, and much to the chagrin of all of the neighbors, and uh, maybe a few calls to make sure his welfare was okay. Uh, he continued you to do that and his brothers have joined in the fun and uh, they helped me in that capacity uh, even uh, tonight. I took a picture of Adrian the other day because I thought hey you're going off to school you need to have some good memories to go with you so he mowed the yard with me one more time and uh, he was actually running the weed eater which is an instrument of torture I won't talk about that tonight and I just took a picture and I cried a little bit behind my sunglasses as I was pushing the lawnmower just thinking of that but uh, that's enough about that. What do we learn about mowing grass? Uh, tonight I want to present to you three astute observations, and I think they relate to the Christian life. Allow me to explain. The first one is this. You need to pick up the trash before you mow over it. Uh, those of you, and I'm not discriminating against you ladies, I know some of you are more skilled than us men even in this uh, wonderful task, uh, but if you're by chance not familiar with that, uh, what happens is you see a little piece of paper about the size of your palm laying in the yard. You're hot and sweaty, and instead of stopping the mower, uh, going and picking that up, maybe putting it in your pocket or depositing it into uh, a trash receptacle, you just mow right over it. And what happens is that little piece of paper about the size of your palm turns into one of those scenes like that we're now celebrating the end of World War II. You remember those ticker tape parades? That's what happens to your yard. It covers the entire yard, and from one little piece of paper about this big, uh, you have an avalanche of little tiny pieces of paper that are now impossible uh, to pick up, and now you've got a mess. Well, what do you learn from that, preacher? You need to pick up the mess. You need to deal with the problem before you run over it, as it were, with your mower. Let me show you how the wise man said this to be true in Proverbs 17, verse 14. He said, the beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. And I don't know if my uh, daddy actually quoted this verse or not to me, uh, but I remember him showing me this from time to time when we would maybe uh, be taking water out to uh, water some of the cattle or maybe even uh, to water some of the vegetables in the garden. That five-gallon bucket, if you turn it over and then you say, well, collect that water again, and you know how the water 
uh, spreads and if it's very dry, uh, we've not had that problem lately, how quick the earth just kind of soaks it in and it's gone. Well, uh, strife, anger, disagreement, conflict uh, is like that. So what do you need to do? You don't need to make it worse. You don't need to escalate it. Uh, you need to deal with it in a proper way. And the Bible tells us how to do that. Proverbs 20 and verse number 3, the Bible said, It's honorable for a man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. And uh, we don't have to look long or far, probably no farther than the guy that shaves with us in the morning, to know that we've been that foolish kind of individual in the past. And we can see that played out in our media. We can see that in every segment uh, of our world. And we're all guilty from time to time, and we need to be cautious about that. The wise man would go on to say in the book of Proverbs uh, that some are not only, uh, not only happy to start a quarrel and then leave the trash for someone else to pick up, as it were, but some like to even go by and even meddle in disagreements that are not their own. Solomon said that's like trying to take a dog by the ears. It's not going to turn out too well for you. Well, what happens when you mow over the trash uh, before... Uh, picking it up, you've got a mess. Uh, you need to be aware that sometimes the best thing to do is to stop, uh, to maybe notice what your involvement is in the situation, the other person's involvement, and see if some remedy can be sought before either of you make it worse than it already is. Of course, Jesus is the master uh, at conflict resolution, as he is in all matters. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that when offering our gift in, at the altar, if we remember our brother has something against us, go and make it right, even before offering your gift, before offering your worship. I wonder how often that instruction is heeded. And I wonder if, and I don't have to wonder if I'm honest, I have to say uh, I've been negligent sometimes myself of even following that command of the Savior. But to be right with God, you need to be right as much as you can with your fellow man. Sometimes your fellow man may not uh, be willing to uh, come to some resolution. There may be disagreement still. It may be over a matter of principle or truth over which if they certainly hold a position that is not in harmony with the will of God, agreement cannot be had. But what we must guard against and what I'm trying to say, of course, in this point is uh, you deal with it before making it worse. If you just mow over the trash, and this isn't my yard on screen if you're wondering about that or anybody else's, but you'll just make it worse. Here's the way Paul said it in Philippians 2, verse 3, let nothing, okay? So here's the preface, let nothing. So what's nothing? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. I think sometimes we read Scripture, we memorize Scripture, we listen to it in sermons and classes, and... It just kind of, if you will, it bounces off of us or it rolls off our back like we say the water off of ducks. Let nothing, nothing that I do be done from selfish ambition or my own selfish pride or conceit. Folks, if that doesn't remind you of times in your life when you've been in violation of this command, then uh, I'd like to shake your hand. I'd like to know because most of us, we know we want what we want, and we want it when we want it, and we'll try to do what we can in order to get it. And as a result, conflict results. That happens between husbands and wives, daddies and mamas, uh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, employees and employers, and uh, you know, classmates and teammates, and on and on and on it goes. But the high ideal that God calls us to is certainly that we would be aware of how we deal with others. And it doesn't mean we're a doormat. Don't get that impression. Some people think, well, if I'm a Christian, I have to let everyone run over me. That's not what we mean. But it does mean that the love that we have for God must demonstrate itself very practically in the way we deal with others. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 to 26, Paul said, Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. There might be a time and this has been a hard lesson for me to learn. I think now with uh, four decades of life under my belt, I've gotten a little better. But I once was really uh, eager. If someone said something and I didn't think that's the way it was or should be, even if it was on one of these foolish or ignorant matters, I'd jump in and I'd try to convince them. Surprisingly so, some people's minds are like concrete. They're thoroughly mixed up and set. You're not going to change them. I mean, that's just the way that it is. So Paul said to Timothy, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. 
but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So there are times when uh, you just need to ignore the situation and you might have to be very uh, forward, very blunt, uh, and very maybe even... Uh, almost, I won't say mean, but you need to be very stern in telling the individual you're not going to get caught up uh, in that. Uh, that's something that you may have your idea about and I have my idea about. And as long as God has not spoken definitively on it, you can have your opinion and I'll have mine. So uh, what do we learn? Well, when we mow the yard, uh, pick up the trash before you mow over it. You'll thank me later uh, when your yard is not covered with all of that um, little chopped up pieces of stuff that you could have easily disposed of had you taken the time to pick it up beforehand. Number two, what I learned from mowing grass, and this really isn't about cutting it necessarily, it's just an observation that grass grows in adverse areas, unfavorable areas. Uh, again, going back to my daddy, he said, if you want grass to grow, just spread some gravel. And that's pretty good advice uh, because if you've ever worked hard on a yard and uh, you've removed all of the rocks and maybe you've applied a nice layer of topsoil, maybe even worked some fertilize into the seed and you put straw and you wait, and then you dump some gravel out on the side and grass grows there uh, like nobody's business. So maybe that's what you need to do when you um, build a home or something. Just spread gravel out in the yard and pretty soon you'll have a nice lush yard. Uh, there is some humor in that, but you know that grass grows in driveway cracks. Uh, if you try to make a new flower bed, you ladies know how grass is invasive and will come uh, to thwart your efforts or at least attempt to do that. But it grows in adverse areas. Uh, there's something unique said about Jesus in Isaiah 53 when we are told that he is the suffering servant and we focus on what he endured on our behalf even as we did this morning. And that's needful talking about how he carried our griefs, how God uh, wounded him for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. We remember those verses, but maybe verse 2 is one that does not receive as much attention. Listen to Isaiah 53, verse 2. Again, the he there is a prophecy. The Jews called it the suffering servant. The New Testament reveals the fulfillment in Jesus the Christ. He shall grow up before him, so we might read it, Christ shall grow up before the Father as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That last part tells us Jesus, by physical appearance, was not someone that was noteworthy. I'm not saying that the Savior was ugly. That would be an improper thing, I guess, to say. But uh, nevertheless, he did not have a physical attraction quality about him that would just draw people to him. Uh, that's not what God wanted from him. That's not even how God wants us to judge each other, merely on physical appearance. Instead of that, though, back up and notice that phrase, he will grow up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. It's been common, especially in the last oh, say 150 to 200 years, as different people have analyzed the life of Jesus and have tried to eliminate any deity or any supernatural uh, connection with Jesus as God's Son, they instead affirm that he's merely a man, a good moral teacher. And very commonly you'll hear these scholars say Jesus was a product of his time. He was a product of his time. Israel was oppressed by the Romans. And so there was a national fervor that simmered below the surface of Jewish society. And Jesus capitalized on that and talked about a kingdom and talked about restoration of the throne of David and things of that nature. And so he kind of fomented this revolution until the Jewish leaders in cahoots with the Roman authorities saw him as a threat and took him out. And that ended uh, his movement, so to speak. Well, that's a terrible injustice and in analysis of history. And further, uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. He was not a product of his environment. The world was very unfavorable. The Jews, even themselves, about the Messiah, about the Savior, had so many misconceptions. And yet Jesus came and he succeeded. One of the terrible, and I don't really just cannot wrap my mind around uh, what is affirmed by those people who uh, especially subscribe to all the different tenets of premillennialism. Uh, one of their cardinal bedrock uh, ideas in that false system of belief is that the church is a plan B of sorts. 
that Jesus came to establish a kingdom on earth and he failed. That's what they have to admit and they'll say it with no qualms. Jesus failed. The Jews rejected him and so the church was plan B. The kingdom was plan A. And they expect us to go lockstep with that sort of notion. No, my Savior did not fail. He did exactly what the Heavenly Father wanted him to do in spite of the adverse circumstances that confronted him. Now you and I, you say, well, what's the point for us? This life is still an adverse place to grow in one sense. In another way, we might say that even though the world is unfavorable and is opposed to us, uh, it is the means, it is the place, it is the arena in which God has given us to grow. Uh, we grow in adversity. The Bible is filled with examples that show this. Joseph is one of my favorite Old Testament characters. How he went from his father's house where all was well to Potiphar's house and then to prison. You recount uh, all of those uh, terrible things that seemed to befall him. And yet the Bible tells us repeatedly in the Genesis narrative that God was with him. Joseph knew God was with him and better still uh, than just considering that God was with him, Joseph went with God. And that is what contributed, no doubt, to his success. Others could be examined. Daniel and his three friends away from home in Babylon, taken from Jerusalem and all that they had known, still in that adverse uh, environment, remained true and faithful to God, both as young people as well as old people. Daniel's that good example, one of the few that we actually have in Scripture that the panorama of his entire life is placed before us as a young man. And not even what we would maybe say a young man as a teenager. So you teenagers, can you serve God even when no one else is? Yes. Can you stand up to the pressures of your culture or your peers? Yes, Daniel did. And then more uh, than six decades later when he's probably north of 80 and some would say uh, even approaching the century mark, he doesn't give in to the demands of a king for ease or comfort. He said, I'll serve him to my very last breath. And they throw him in the lion's den for his devotion to God, and yet God delivers him once more. And so we grow in adverse circumstances. Uh, the present circumstances uh, since uh, maybe the 1st of March, uh, they've been adverse. I'll be the first to admit that. The CDC released a report this week, and... Um, it was met, depending on what news outlet or what organization you uh, were consulting for the report, some, they were just surprised beyond measure. And the report was this, that the COVID-19 virus ramifications, especially as it relates to lockdown and the isolation and separation of people, has increased mental health uh, occurrences by more than 40%. And people, some of them were shocked at that. What the number is, is probably much higher. We have no reason uh, to doubt the veracity of that. We know it's been tough. And yet in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10, uh, I find an example that I've turned to often in these last few months. And uh, I need to be reminded of it. And maybe tonight you do too. Paul said, uh, having enjoyed the favor of God, and you can debate exactly what that entailed in verses 1 to 6. He said he had a thorn in the flesh that God had given him. And again, there is great debate over what that thorn in the flesh uh, was in his life. Some sort of physical ailment, it does seem likely that it was that, but speculation runs rampant on the particular details. Uh, I, I want you to notice something that isn't often, though, uh, pointed out. When he says a thorn in the flesh was given to me, uh, the word there for given is our same word, or it's the same word in the original language that our English word grace comes from. I was graced with a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Now, you may say, how does grace and a messenger of Satan go together? That's maybe another lesson for another time. But he said, this was to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And the word there for buffet just literally means to just take and beat the living daylights out of. So Paul said, this was not a pleasant thing to deal with. So I pleaded. That's a strong word in verse 8. Begging the Lord three times, not just he prayed three times one day and said, okay, that's it. I think this was probably an extended period, maybe of prayer, maybe including fasting, may include other things that Paul really devoted himself to seeking uh, an answer from the Lord and not just any answer, but a removal of this adverse 
condition, whatever it might have been. God answered him, my grace is sufficient for you. Notice my grace. We read that. What's that grace? Well, that grace that I gave you, Paul. My strength, Paul, is made perfect in weakness. And so most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So I take pleasure, if you read the bulletin article, uh, this is kind of piggybacking off of that from this morning. I take pleasure. I regard it with joy, my infirmities, my reproaches, my needs, persecutions, distresses, all of these things for Christ's sake. In other words, I look at them through that lens. I look at them through uh, the means whereby I can use them to grow to be more of what Christ would have me to be, it seems, uh, is what he is inferring. This is the reason why, when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, it sounds like a statement that is a paradox, contradictory on its face. How can you be strong when weak? You're either one or the other, aren't you, Paul? No, Paul says, I'm not. When I'm weak... In these times, and it seems especially that he's speaking of the physical body, fleshly, when I'm mentally and physically at a point when uh, I don't have uh, maybe my best uh, to offer, when I'm not feeling as well as I would like, when I'm not able to do all that I would maybe like to be able to do or may have done uh, previously, when all of these things adversely affect me, if I use them for Christ's sake, if I put my trust in Him to provide and give what is needed, then in those moments I'm strong, very, very strong, because I recognize my dependence for my God. Now, uh, I would like to interview Paul and would like to ask him even further clarification uh, from that. I'm supposing that's uh, the gist of what he's talking about. I think he gives us a clue in Romans 5 verse 3 when he said, I glory in tribulations. Because I know that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance does produce character. And character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. In other words, I keep yearning and wanting. This world is not what I want. But there is something that God has promised that I do want. And so I'm not comfortable enough here to think that I have all that I need. And maybe you and I, maybe we should give thanks to God more than we do for His adverse gifts, His gracing us with the difficulties that life presents us with. If these last few months haven't um, cultivated and kindled within you a renewed desire to go to heaven, I don't know what else could or would or will. If they have not caused you to yearn and say, I can't wait to we're in a place where we can be together, and there won't be any separation. I mean, that's the essence of what heaven is. God will be with them and be their God, and they will be His people. And maybe things like this we ought to be more thankful for instead of complaining about. And I can say that I need to do that much better than I do. Grass grows in adverse areas, so should we. We can learn from that. Number three, the last point tonight. Grass grows from its base. And we need to do that. Now, uh, if you have you know, a grove of fruit trees or uh, you have a stand of hardwoods. Uh, if you want to not worry about raking leaves, just go and cut them off about halfway up, uh, every one of them, and you don't have to worry about them anymore. You'll have um, just what's left there of the main trunk and in time that'll rot and decay and it'll fall over too. But funny thing about grass, you can cut it, you can get a little rain, a little sunshine, and a couple of days later, it's popped back up. And it's ready to go again. And uh, it's because, of course, that grass doesn't grow from the tips. That's not where the life is, but it's at the base. Uh, that's where it grows. Now, uh, I have tried to study a little bit about grass in various settings. I worked with one of my elders in Mississippi on his sod farm. And so he gave me a lot of education about that. Um, uh, in that area, and if you want to know what hard work is, lay sod in South Mississippi, and that's one of the lessons I learned. I also learned uh, two pallets of sod with a um, two-wheel drive Mazda truck doesn't work too well going down the highway. That's another story for another day, too. But anyway, uh, you have to have a strong root system, and grass grows from there up. Well, what about you and me? We need a strong root system. We need to grow, if you will, from our base. Well, what is our base? Again to the Corinthians, this time in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul said, 
that it is, of course, God and His grace that was given to him. Paul used it as a wise master builder would. We're kind of changing the analogy a little bit here. But he says, take heed how you build. Because there is only one foundation that will stand. There's only one foundation that is sure. And that foundation, of course, which is laid is Christ Jesus. That is what has to be the basis of your life. And if there is anything else as the base, uh, you're bound to disappointment at some time in some way. And uh, that's just something that's been proven true again and again. Proverbs 4 and verse 23, uh, the internal is shown to be more important than the external. And uh, this is what we're really trying to get at in our Sunday morning class about the mind of Christ. We focus on our behaviors outward that others observe. And yet Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring or proceed the issues of life. And there the heart is the mind. Take heed how you think. Take heed uh, the framework, the perspective, the worldview, whatever you want to call it. Take heed that you think and understand how God must play in to your uh, way of living. Yes, outwardly, your choices and behaviors, no doubt, but it starts with that base. Now, an amazing thing uh, about grass uh, that you may not know, uh, we think about grass and we think about encouraging it to grow. One of the things that we do that you might have done this spring, you may have done it even if you're uh, very meticulous, you might have even fertilized your yard in the summer. But we provide, and you can buy this at Walmart or co-op, a fertilized product. And what you may tend to believe, and most people do, they put those nutrients on their grass and they assume that the grass takes those in and that feeds the lawn. But in fact, that's not the case. Uh, your grass only uses those nutrients as raw materials and it's not really food at all. Now they take those raw materials and with photosynthesis, if you go back to science class, they are able to convert those to sugars and they are able then of course to produce growth thereby. What's the point? Here's the point. If you go to Philippians 2 and verse 15, what the Bible tells us that we must do or what uh, is the task of each child of God is that we would take uh, His Word and that we would work out our salvation. You remember how uh, Paul describes working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, that is that I have a responsibility to do that uh, on my own. I have the responsibility to take the things that uh, God has given me and utilize them as I should. And if I fail to do that, um, you know, that's on me. The church can, and one of the things that we've even talked about uh, this evening before worship, uh, one of the things that we miss so much in this time is the opportunity for especially our children to be in Bible class. And that is something that uh, hurts us, and we know it hurts them. And uh, it's hard to balance exactly how to make that work like we would want. But uh, the idea, of course, is that we think, well, a class, being presented the Word of God, that's what I have to take in. Well, that's what you do take in. But you see, our task is just to take these things and digest them and incorporate them into growth. You have to make the decision. You have to make the choice if you will use that base that is Christ. And if you will use that and do uh, that which he has asked of you to do. Now, if you uh, do not, who's to blame? Uh, some people, and they're quick, and you've heard the complaints. The church didn't meet my need. The church didn't provide me a Bible class or that sermon or uh, those elders or whatever the case may be. Paul said in Philippians 2 here, uh, you've obeyed, yes. But now he wasn't with them in his absence. So verse 12, work it out. You do your part. Is he insinuating that I make God in my debt, as it were? Is he saying, do everything perfectly and God will have to save you? That's not what he means whatsoever. That would be foolish to assert or assume. But he says, take your base. Take your understanding, your conviction that Jesus is the Christ and your need for him as your Savior and build on that. Grass will grow back, and even when you cut it off, sometimes, uh, as it were, if we extended the analogy, sometimes life just kind of scalps us off, cuts us off, and uh, we have difficulty. But if that base, which is Christ, that root that remains, which is His, uh, that foundation, our relationship with Him, uh, we can come back. 
So what do we learn from grass? Well, I can tell you a lot of uh, other reasons. I can tell you how far a push mower will throw an apple. Uh, that's a fun uh, thing to learn. I can tell you about a lot of other things that probably uh, I would get uh, your younger ones in trouble uh, to hear about, so I'll just refrain from doing most of those things tonight. But uh, pick up the trash before you mow over it. Uh, grow in adverse circumstances, even like grass does, and then uh, grow from your base and make sure your base is Christ. And that base uh, that we spoke of this morning that we all need is the Savior. It is Jesus and uh, what he has done for us. And uh, you see, as we've presented uh, these slides at different points to uh, try to help us understand what's involved in uh, rendering obedience to the gospel. The gospel is enacted and was by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's good news. That's news the world had never heard before, that a man could defeat death and live again. Jesus, as God's Son, did that. And I reenact, as it were, and as we talked about this morning extensively from Romans chapter 6, I die to sin. I'm buried as he was, not in a tomb, but I'm buried uh, in that grave called baptism, in the likeness of his death, but in the likeness of his resurrection, I come forth and then I can walk in newness of life, no longer a slave of sin. Tonight, if you believe that, having heard that good news message, if you will turn, and repentance is all about turning, Jesus said it was so necessary that we'll perish if we don't, changing your mind to understand that this is what you need to do and live for God, then you confess your faith by taking these steps. Confession isn't merely what one says outwardly. It does involve that, but it involves the actions that one takes as well. In every example in the book of Acts, uh, we see that those who acted on their faith did these things that we're asking you to do tonight if you're not a Christian. And Jesus said it maybe most simply when he says having that belief or that faith, believing and being baptized is what assures one of being saved and we rejoice tonight as was mentioned already that our sister Gail now uh, did that so uh, follow her good example if you need to do so and make that known to us if uh, you need to pray uh, and need prayers of even others on your behalf for forgiveness uh, if you just need strength I didn't say it this morning but I hope it came through the simple message on the fact that Jesus if he needed help then I need help and the strong person isn't the person who says, I can do it on my own. The strong person is the person who says, I need God's help. And there are times in our life when that especially is something that uh, maybe we need to say with a greater amount of fervency than what we do. And it may be tonight that uh, as a Christian, you simply need us to pray for you for strength, for some difficulty you're facing. It may be forgiveness that you need. Well, those needs can be made known to us, again, in this remote way uh, tonight. We invite you to call or text Brother Brian at 931-787-0833. That's 787-0833. And if not during the singing of this next song, at any point, we want to be available to serve you. We want to help you. and We want to give you uh, that glorious hope that Jesus gives us through his word. But tonight especially, at this time, during the singing of the next song, if we can help you, we hope you'll allow us to do that. King of my life, I crown thee. 